Hi, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to have you here tonight for Woodcock Wanderings. My name is Lisa Salisville and I'm with Vermont Coverts Woodlands for Wildlife. And we are a statewide nonprofit group that works with landowners to educate them about sound forest management and wildlife stewardship. Tonight, we're joined by David Salisville, who is a program manager with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. And he's gonna to talk to us tonight about one of my favorite birds, uh, particularly in March, because it reminds me that spring is coming when I hear them painting in the woods. He's gonna be talking to us about the woodcock, also called the timber doodle, and many, many other fun uh, nicknames that this bird is given. So uh, David, I'll let you tell a little bit about yourself and then jump right into uh, woodcock wanderings. So, uh, hi, Dave, David Sawzell here and uh, work with Vermont's Fish and Wildlife Department. Uh, as one of the program managers and I'm stationed up out of the Essex Junction office, been with the department for about 21 years now and uh, primarily been working in wetlands management, uh, forest, forest management and uh, migratory game birds such as ducks, geese and, and woodcock. So tonight, like I said, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen here. We'll be talking about the uh, American woodcock, and I want to go over a little bit of the, oops, let's see if we can get it going here for us first. There we go. All right. So as I said, we're talking about the American woodcock, and I'm going to focus a little bit on the habitats that they use, a project that we have ongoing with the uh, University of Maine out of Orono and a little bit about the life history of the bird. And really the, the, the woodcock is a migratory shorebird that's adapted to living within the forested habitat. If you look at that long bill, you probably it looks very similar to some of the uh, shorebirds running along the, the coastal area. And they, they, they use some of the same activities of probing with their bill to find their food. And, but before we get going, I just wanna lay a little bit of background for our department. As I said, we kind of we were missioned to take care of all the plants, wildlife, and fish within the state and the habitats that they need, and we're doing that for the people of Vermont, and that's all of the people of Vermont. We're trying to maintain a diversity of habitats and those natural ecosystems that they need to to maintain themselves. And just to kind of give you an idea of how we're funded within the department, uh, primarily we have what we call the Pittman Robertson funds. Those come out of uh, taxes that uh, hunters and uh, target shooters pay on firearms and the ammunitions that are out there. We also have licenses that are sold for hunting and, and fishing throughout the state. The Vermont duck stamp is one that we use to purchase and manage lands around the state. And then over the last several years, we've actually been able to get some what they call capital funds from our, our general fund within the state taxes. So we were able to use those to help improve our parking areas and wildlife viewing areas and, and areas such as that. And we also work with uh, nonprofits and NGOs, non-government organizations, and uh, match our funds together with the federal funds to, to expand our, our ability to do projects. And one of the newest funding sources for us is that what we call our habitat stamp. And we use that as match to go after a number of federal grants around the, the programs. But to manage these birds, you have to think much further than, than Vermont. We work within what we call the flyway system. Vermont's within the Atlantic flyway. And so we're working with units from um, and states and provinces from Canada down through the Southern states. We're all working together. And that's within, for Woodcock, many of our migratory birds, we work with Mexico and even down into to further into Central America. So we have the flyway system. And then within the um, Woodcock management, we have what we call our Eastern management unit, which Vermont is part of, and our central management unit. And within those management units, we treat those as two separate populations. And we try to do what we call habitat joint ventures. These birds are migratory, so obviously what we do here in Vermont helps them during the breeding season, but they're not here during the winter. So we need to work with our partners and states further south to work together and have all of the habitat needs that are there. And I just put this in as an example, the top images show you more of the natural flight patterns of the birds. You can see this uh, going down the East Coast, that's the Atlantic Flyway. 
And then you can see birds who are following the Mississippi River using natural corridors. And then also in our central flyway where they end up down in the Gulf Coast and then our Pacific flyway. And those were all found by uh, band returns that people have um, when we're banding them up further up north and the birds are harvested or recited by uh, birders with uh, binoculars or scopes and they, they can submit them to a national registry and that helps set up a lot of our national wildlife refuges. It helped us target areas to uh, purchase lands and provide those stopover habitats as you know urbanization built up into them. And as I mentioned, we have two management units that we work with. We have all of this gray area that I'm circling here, that is all breeding habitat and the breeding range of the birds. So we're looking at from Ontario and Quebec and the Maritimes down to even into Florida and Louisiana. But the primary areas where we survey for these birds in the spring are in the mostly the mid-Atlantic and northern states. And obviously, if we're going to manage these birds and, and look at the habitat, we need to know a little bit about their trends. And how do we do that? Each spring, we have what we call spring singing ground surveys. And some of the uh, coverts cooperators help us with this. They volunteer to go out and do the routes for us. They're, they're designated transects that have been in place since 1968. And we're looking at the trends, the change and the number of birds that we hear singing and displaying on each one of these routes. And part of this information that we had showing the decrease in the number of birds that we're hearing actually helped prompt some of this research that we'll go over in a little bit. Because we know a lot about what happens to the birds during their breeding season because we're able to, to track them uh, on the breeding grounds and we're able to track them during the, uh, the wintering period, but we haven't been able to look at what happens during their migratory period. So that'll be a little bit about what we talk about. Another way that we help to monitor the birds is we ask hunters each year to submit wings from birds that they harvest. And we can look at that and get an, a ratio of um, adults to, to young each year to see how the production was in the wild. We can also look at the ages and the sex ratios, and then we can tell this all by the types of wings that are on the feathers. And we acquire that survey and, and request that information from those people from what we call the Harvest Information Program. Everybody that's uh, uh, hunting those birds is required to register within that. That gives us a sample to draw from. So just a little bit about the birds. We'll put this up here. The males are actually smaller than females in most bird species. That a lot of hawks also, and it holds true for woodcock. But they're only about 7.3 ounces is the largest size of the female and about 5.8 ounces for the males. And one thing that helps us identify whether it's a male or female because they look exactly like when you hold these birds in hand is these outer three primary feathers on the wings. They're actually narrower on the male. So if you have one where you hold them together and you measure it and it's 12.4 millimeters or less, you actually have, that, that's a male. And when they've checked this internally with the sex organs in comparison on the males, and it's been 99% accurate. So that's a pretty good um, percentage to, to be able to trust that. The other way that you can look at the bird is if their bill is two and a half inches or less, you have a male bird, and if it's two and three quarter inches or longer, you have the, a female bird. And uh, that has held very true throughout the years. And um, that was used during the study to also double check. Another neat feature about this bird before we move on is, is um, the bills are probing in the ground. They have the end of the bill is kind of prehensile where it can, it can bend out and grab a hold of those earthworms that they're searching for for food. And lastly, as you can see, the eye on the bird is very far back on the head and, and it's off to the side. And that helps them to be able to see almost 360 degrees to see if there's a ground predator and aerial predators coming in on them. Where if you think about a hawk, their, their eyes are set forward where they can focus in and really target in on the prey item. So different adaptations when you're a, a prey species compared to a, a predatory species. So, what I brought up here is the trend line for the singing ground surveys in the different regions. Ours is the top up here in the eastern region. And as you can see, if you're trying to, to maintain a population, you don't like to see this trending downward line. You'd like to see a nice flat line. This is one time on a monitor, you'd like to see a flat line occur. And over the last 60 years, you can see we've gone from about four birds per singing ground a route to about two. So we've lost about half the singing, singing birds on these areas. And a lot of this we're attributing to 
habitat loss. If you think about uh, the changes on the landscape since the late 1960s to today, our forest and shrubland areas have matured. We've gone away from that young forest setting and we've reached into a more of a mature forest somewhere between 80 and 120 years of age and it's very monotypic in, in size. So what the actually decrease, I forgot to mention on that last sl slide was um, in our area about 1.2% decrease in birds per year. So that's the you know, slow, steady de decrease in the number of birds that we're hearing. Then kind of switching over to a little bit of their life history. So most of the time the birds, when you find them in the daytime, you're looking at them in young forest and shrubland areas. They're out in there foraging. And then, but during the breeding period, that's usually from March to April. As Lisa said on in the introduction, usually you'll start seeing them show up in the Champlain Valley of Vermont right around March when the snow's receding. And then other portions of the state, they often show up a little bit later because they need that exposed ground to feed. So our, our breeding and uh, display time is at March to May period and they need small clearings such as old pasture areas, uh, log landings, some of the uh, right of ways for power lines are used as those sites. And, and we've even seen them in front lawns before near puddles and, and areas, especially if you get a late snowstorm, it's not very good for the birds. After the breeding season, the birds start to hatch out in May and June. Uh, I'll show you a photo a little bit later of a small day old chick that I found on uh, May 27th of this year for part of the nesting study that was ongoing. So they, they hatch out as early as May. So there really is only about a 30 day period and they're hatching out. You have to realize these birds have to grow and uh, reach a big enough size so they can migrate here in October and November. So they have to put on a lot of size and, and wait before they can take off. Their feeding areas are mostly in moist soil areas and young forests that are 20 years of age or less. And they're looking for nice, rich soils where they're gonna find good numbers of earthworms. And then the cover locations, areas where they wanna nest and bring the broods in to, to, to escape. They're looking for areas that are somewhere in the realm of about 6,000 stems per acre. If you think about that, how thick that is, if you look at a new clear cut area and within about two years of growth and it's so thick you can't walk through it, that's the type of cover they're looking for for their, for their nesting and brood rearing. And usually that lasts and is in good condition for about 10 years, and they'll continue to use it to about a 20 year age period. And then our birds will start to leave us again about this time of year, late October and uh, early November. Uh, I just had a report come in today, some of the birds that we tagged this year. Uh, one of them is in Ohio right now. Uh, three others have made it to the western part of New York and then we have two down in Virginia and a, a few others are still here in Vermont holding out. And a lot of our birds, they, they, the roosting areas, are, or excuse me, the uh, wintering areas are down in the Virginia, South Carolina area. So the, the study that we're involved with in this, uh, this is a flyway wide effort from all the states and Canadian provinces. We have 12 states that chipped in money for this and three Canadian provinces is the American Woodcock Migration and Ecology Study. So what, what are we looking for in this? Why are we spending this money? And I can, I'll give you some numbers on this, but we're looking to evaluate kind of the migration, the phenology and ecology of when they're going, what habitats they're using. You know, we wanna better understand where, where they're migrating and when. So maybe we can, we need to change our uh, singing ground survey, you know, it hasn't been evaluated in a number of years. This can tell us if we need to change the time of the year that we're actually looking for the birds. You know, with changes in temperatures and the climate, maybe we have to change when we're looking for these birds and just to get a better handle on, on the number that are out there. It can also help us to inform us of, you know, the risks that we're putting these birds under during a harvest period. Do we need to change the period that people are allowed to hunt these birds to reduce the harvest rates and to reduce the impacts on these birds? Or can we leave them the same? Uh, how is it connected between the different management units? We, right now we have two separate management units for the populations. Is that still a valid way to manage them or should we combine both of those units and be working together across the mid, Midwest to the Eastern seaboard and work, manage them as one population instead of two? We wanna look at the landscape and how the patterns are affecting them, where they're stopping over, 
you know, how is development and the increased number of uh, structures out there to fly into affecting them? Is the light increase with the light pollution affecting them? There are a lot of unknown uh, effects during the migration. And then on top of this, we're, you know, with the two PhD students that we have that are were funded through this program, we also have a master's students down at the uh, master's student down at the University of Rhode Island who's doing the nest success study and some survival. So they're actually getting quite a bit of, of uh, information on them, and we're looking forward to when they they defend their their projects and pass that information on to us. So as I mentioned, um, the project is uh, with 12 states and, and three provinces. And it began back in 2018. And we have one more year. We're in our fifth year of the study. We're looking at one more year to make it six years. And we've deployed over 400 units. And each one of those little units that we put on these, uh, the woodcock, they cost between the unit themselves and the satellite time about $2,000. So we're looking at almost uh, $670,000 just in equipment and satellite time alone for this, these projects. And each year between salaries and uh, main, helping to maintain the PhD candidates, we look it costs about $300,000 to run this program. So it takes a lot of time, a lot of, a lot of funding to, to make this work. So within the project, just from the beginning, uh, I'll mention some of the partners in Vermont. Besides the Fish and Wildlife Department, we, we brought in, uh, we're able to bring in TNC, the Nature Conservancy has uh, been able to purchase a couple of units each year, and they've allowed us on one of their preserves, they've done some mowing to, to site prep the areas to help us capture. We've, the U.S. Forest Service has helped fund some of this, the Wildlife Management Institute. Uh, we've worked with both the Missisquoi National Wildlife Refuge and the Conte Refuge up in the Northeast Kingdom. And Audubon, Vermont's been able to help send out uh, one staff member to help us trap, trap birds and uh, put satellite transmitters on them. So after we've brush hogged an area, uh, we also put out mist nets. We try to capture the birds right in the evening hours when they start to fly out from their feeding areas in the woods. They know when the dust starts to hit, then they, they start to go out to their, their night roost areas, which is in some old field settings. And I'll show you some of that in just a moment. And we also, after we've checked our nets and then uh, closed them up so we don't capture any other wildlife during this the evening period, we'll go out with spotlights and walk the fields and, and we're spotlighting the ground, trying to see the bird on the ground before it flushes and, and then capture it with, a, with a, a large fish net that we can put over the top of them. Now, as I said, we've, we put out 18 units in 2020 and 10 units in 2021. And uh, all of the 10 units this year have already signed on to the satellites and we've been able to uh, show that they're moving. And we did have one, one unit this year that was actually harvested by a, a hunter who called me and returned the unit to us and we'll use that next year on another bird. But this is the type of habitat that you're looking for. It's a nice mosaic of you know, mature forest. You can see there's old shrublands and pasture land areas here. And there's also farm fields and uh, that they can use as open cover. This is ideal looking woodcock habitat because you have all different age classes of forest land in, in this aerial photo. On our capture site, this is just fairly simple. You can see these old fields, kind of old pasture setting with some of these shrubs that have started to invade. You don't want to let it take over forever, but this is great roosting habitat at night. And these mowed strip, it's, it's maybe uh, anywhere from six to eight feet wide. And you go over it once, maybe twice with the brush hog, and, and the birds like to come into these areas because it's, it's not thick enough to hide a predator, but they also have enough clumps of grass and or shrubs where they can use it to, to uh, protect themselves from aerial predators if, if they're working the night. You know, great horned owls are, are very efficient predators. And if you have a fox or a mink or something working the ground, the birds can see them approaching. It's open enough for them to see that. So once we capture the birds, I, I, unfortunately, I don't have good pictures of us capturing the birds because we were obviously busy working the equipment. And I couldn't video us at the same time. But we, we placed this small unit on them. It's called a, a low-tech pinpoint GPS transmitter. So this is uh, 
only supposed to be 4% or less of the body weight. So if you remember, it's 7.3 and about 5.8 ounces for the males and females. So we, these units are four grams for the males and 6.3 grams for the females. Very tiny, uh, with the advances in technology, we've, they've been able to shrink them down small enough so that we can actually put them on the birds and follow them during the migration. And with the battery life on these units, we're able to get between 75 and 125 locations. And they're, they're, we can program them with a computer to either give us readings daily or every other day. And we only expect them to really last until October, from October 15th when we catch them to about the end of the year, the uh, December 31st, somewhere in that realm. We've been lucky that some of these have actually continued to run longer and we've been able to get some of the return flights. Um, but we also have the Southern states that are placing these on the birds and uh, we're watching them come from the wintering areas back north to us and onto the, the nesting sites. And once these are placed on the birds, um, we can track them by the Argo satellite system. And what, what they give us is we're within 20 meters of accuracy. We can pinpoint them within 20 meters of where that signal is and it gives us a lat long and we can zoom in on, on them from uh, aerial photos. And we can also go in on the sites when we think a bird is nesting and, and go into the GPS unit and try to find them. So the, this is just a picture of our field work at night. This is some pictures from last year when COVID was, was coming on heavy and we all had to wear masks and face shields and be outside at the same time. But once we capture the birds, we put them in a small cloth sack. You can see in the left hand of the person to the left and that keeps the bird calm so that they don't injure themselves. And we take a number of measurements. We'll, we'll measure the bill length. We look at the feathers, as we said, to be able to sex them. We will remove a small amount of blood. We're doing some genetics work so that we can see if the populations are the same genetically or if they're, if they're different populations that we, we need to look at. And then we also have been removing one feather where we can take what it's called a radioisotope. We can tell where the birds came from by what they've been feeding on and what's in the area so we can track that. So once we have the birds in hand and we've taken all these measurements, we we'll start putting on, on the, uh, the backpack unit we call, it's actually called a rump unit because it goes over the backside of the, of the animal and it just goes around the legs so it's not impeding the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the wings at all. And you can see kind of here with my cursor, if you can see it moving in circles, that's the total size of the unit and the antenna is coming out the back underneath the hand with the players. And what we're using here is called jewelry cord where people make bracelets or some of the jewelry that kids and other people put together. And then we have these small lock, lock washers that we crimp down on the unit once it's fitting snugly onto the animal. And our hope is, and what the intent with the test that they've done on these units is, once the batteries have died and the unit is no longer needed, this material that's holding it on will, will degrade and it will fall off the bird so they don't have to carry that around for the rest of their lifetime. And in this picture, you get a better view of, of the bill and the bird. Um, we're placing a small leg band on the bird. If any of you have been out to either help with duck banding or if you've gone out mist netting for songbirds, these are small bands that will fit around the, the, the leg of the bird and it has an individual number and it ha usually has a, a phone number. And now it has a website where you can uh, report that at the national lab and we'll know if the bird has been captured somewhere else or if it's been harvested and gives us some information on where the birds are moving from. And then this is what the bird looks like when it's ready to go. You can see the antenna coming out the back side here where my, my cursor is going. And when you place the birds down on the ground, generally they, they kind of sit there and adjust themselves a little bit to get used to that. And we have them uh, fly off usually within 30 seconds or left to go out and roost back on the field. So, why, why are we doing this? We wanted to know what habitat they're using and, and at different times of the year. But I'll give you some of the fun facts to start off is uh, the birds on average, they've been migrating over 900 miles uh, from the north to the southern states. And the longest, uh, or not the longest, but I should say the, uh, the average single flight per night is about 140 miles. And if you think about the size of this bird and, and where, where they're traveling fun, from, um, it's pretty impressive they can go 140 miles. 
And then on average, what we found in the first year in Vermont is that our birds are leaving us right around November 7th. And this year showed the same thing. We still have a few birds in a state. So the next week or so, I expect them to, to leave, especially if the snow starts showing up in the region that they're in. So the birds are leaving in November. And then it generally takes them somewhere between 19 and 25 days to migrate. So they'll fly and quite often they only stop for one night, but they tend to have four or five stopover sites as they fly south and, um, and they complete that within 19 to 25 days. So they'll stop in areas if they, you know, hit bad weather, they'll stop if they have to, you know, get tired and have to refuel or something like that. And that, and they also found that with, with this about 35% of the birds are crossing between management units. So we're having them go into that central management unit from our area. And what they found with the return flights in the spring is that they usually start taking off from down south right around March 6th to 10th. And that's why we see our birds show up about mid-March, late March. And it takes them a little longer. They take a little bit longer time, about 29 days to move back north. And they usually stop four or five or, five or six times uh, en route. And then with this, what they're, we're hoping to find on top of the timing of our migrations, but what, what's the cause of the mortality? Um, we haven't got any results back yet, but we're looking for those in the next year. And then they're looking at habitat use. Uh, some of the unusual areas that we found them in are the, uh, the clover leaves and their interchanges on your interstates. They've been stopping there. But if you look at that habitat, that's kind of a nice roosting area because generally it's mowed grass and has a little bit of brush or, or you know, tufts of taller grass, and um, and and they've been using a lot of um, uh, clear-cut areas in the southern states. So here's some of the birds from the, the first year from Maine. You can see the bird left Maine in November 4th, and it was in New York on the 5th, and you, great distances. And then if you go on onto the website, and we can post this website later for the study, you can click on these circles and it will expand into a number of other circles and you can keep zooming in on these locations and you can see the habitat that they're using. And if, just looking at the, the right hand side, we zoomed in a little bit for you on that, on the, the sections that say A, B, and C, and it shows where the birds are moving from. You look over on, the, on section A where that cluster of red circles is, that's where they're feeding during the daytime. And then they're moving back out to the various field settings and shrub areas uh, to the north and or southwest for the evening roost areas. And you can see also that they, they like to use a lot of that edge habitat and, and that picture in number B. Yeah. And going back and forth between the fields and that young forest. Now here's just the birds from last year. We plotted them all so you they travel. We trapped them in three locations. Up, one was up in the Conte Refuge up in the Northeast Kingdom, the Missisquoi Refuge up in the northwest corner of our state, and then kind of um, west central down in the West Haven area. And the birds primarily followed the Appalachian Mountains down south, and you can see a high number of them stayed in Virginia, but we had them go down into the South Carolina area over, you know, into Alabama, Mississippi, and worked their way through Tennessee, and a few of them went over into Ohio and then decided to come back across the Appalachians and ended up in Virginia. So habitat needs, we've talked about this a little bit, but a lot of shrubby pasture lands, we need early successional forest. And if, and if you think about um, Vermont, we don't have a lot of that anymore. We'd like to see 10% of that young forest throughout the state, whereas most of our management units that have been inventoried statewide, we're only at about two or 3%. But with that being said, you know, as people are working on their management plans or working with, with neighbors, you can look across borders as some of your training has shown you in some of the workshops that you've gone to. You can look at the, um, what your neighbor has done, work with your neighbors to uh, increase some of that young forest habitat. And you wanna work with a professional to help you kind of plan out where that habitat should be. We have a number of people within our own department. We have uh, people uh, within uh, consulting foresters that are learning about this, but you, you wanna place it in really rich soil areas and also um, some of your, your hardwood forest areas. You wouldn't wanna put them in an area that had like a, um, an endangered plant or a wintering area for 
uh, white-tailed deer because those are not great habitats for, for woodcock, number one. And also you, uh, you wanna maintain management for all species that are out there. So as I said earlier, you know, you need rich soils and need earthworm areas. And what you really need is, is the forest land to be in a 40 year rotation. If you're looking just, just managing for woodcock, they want that younger, younger area. And you wanna have it in kind of groups and mosaic of five acre cuts. So you want 25% of your, of your forest always in the zero to 10, the 11 to 20 and the 21 to 30 and the 31 to 40 age class. And that's very intensive management. So you have to make that financially viable if you're going to do that with uh, a timber harvest. You have to have something that is attractive enough to bring in a logger and to make it economic for them to be there. But if you manage these properly, <clears throat> what you're looking for is around eight singing ground sites per 100 acres. You want these about half acre each. And within that 100 acres, you need at least one roosting field. And that roosting field should be about five acres in size. The other, this is a picture I promised earlier about uh, uh, a young bird that attached out. It's a one day old bird. And we were able to go in on the nest site with the, uh, a GPS unit and the hen took off right at my feet and, and the, the small one scattered. And I'm just gonna show you some of the, the 20 year old or some of the nesting habitat that they're using. This is about a two to three year old clear cut. You can see a lot of ferns have come in and the raspberries, but the birds were over in this kind of spruce, young, small tree forested area. They're looking for the small setting. And it's also very thick habitat, but this is gonna be excellent grounds in the future to be raising broods and to be increasing the number of nests that are on site because it was, when I was there, we sampled the soil and it was very rich, very moist soil. So it's, it's perfect habitat that birds like to use. And then, you know, as we were saying before, you know, what can, what can landowners do when we're working to restore the population? Because what our goal is with the woodcock and many of our other early successional species is to try to return them to the population levels of the 70s and 80s. As I said, we need about 10% young forest area on the, the site. And these areas also benefit 50 plus species of wildlife that like early successional habitat. So it's not just gonna be the woodcock that you would be benefiting. Birds such as green winged warblers, moose and bear use these areas, fox, you know, cottontail rabbits and snowshoe hares, and then even, you know, like alder and willow flycatchers all use these areas. So if you can incorporate young forest into your management plan and work with your neighbors, that, that's the way that we're gonna be able to reach that within the state because of all the land that's owned by in private ownership. And other areas, if you don't have, or other ways, if you don't have uh, land enough to, to do this is, you know, work with your towns to help protect the habitat for the woodcock and for all forms of wildlife. There's management programs that you can contribute to. And then also work to educate your neighbors and, and work together, as we said. Um, you know, the best way to get to people and to inform them of the information that's out there is to talk to your neighbors because you know them, you have that relationship and they're willing to, to listen to you and talk with you probably a little bit easier than they are somebody coming in right off the street and, and uh, talking about a program. And one of the biggest threats, and we've, we were talking about this today with some of my coworkers is uh, controlling exotic species. If you look at a lot of our forests, you have honeysuckle, buckthorn, barberry, it's really coming in. And with the changing climate, we're seeing new species show up all the time and it's pushing out our native species on that area. If we were to manage, if I had a complete control over an area, which they had, and they did some studies on um, Moosehorn National Wildlife Refuge up in Maine, when everything comes together, we have the roosting habitat, the nesting habitat, and the feeding areas, you know, and you get your display areas. They were able to monitor and find 500 woodcock on 500 acres. And so anywhere between 500 and 1,000 acres, if it was just managed for woodcock, you could actually have 500 birds on the area. And that, and that shows you that when they manage the, the property 
for that particular type of early successional habitat over that 40 year rotation, they were able to bring the birds back in and they were able to recover quite heavily. And then as kind of going through these programs, I just wanted to mention a lot of our partners and, and out there for both habitat management and, and work on this project. Again, with the Nature Conservancy, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, the Wild Turkey Federation, and you know our own funding sources within Ducks Unlimited and Habitat Stamps. And our, and our goal is to try to return the bird back to the forest and, uh, and have these sustained populations with all the additional pressures that are being placed on them. And I can take some, stop sharing. There, I'll stop sharing the screen. Great, David, thank you so much. That was a lot of information. Um, if there are any questions out there for David, go ahead and type them in the chat box and I'll go ahead and relay them. Um, I'm gonna start off with a question, Dave, while they're all thinking and trying to frantically write in the chat box, I hope. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, forests and carbon sequestration and, you know, how do you find the balance uh, between, you know, having trees sequestering carbon in this early successional forests? You know, what should I as a landowner be thinking? Right. With, with forests and carbon sequestration, they're, they're learning more all the time. And but with the, the harvesting and the monitoring that we do of our forests, we're actually growing more forest timber on, on the stands that we are harvesting by a great extent each year. And also a lot of that carbon is now stored down in the soils and in the root system. So you can't just be thinking about the, um, the, the tree you see above ground. And the other factors to think about in balancing this is, you know, if we don't harvest trees within our own region, we're going to be importing wood products and, and supplies from around the world, and, and that has a larger carbon footprint by all the shipping costs, all the production costs, and many of these regions don't have our, our regulations on how to produce these, so um, we can have actually a smaller footprint of carbon if we buy, find our products here locally within our own forest system. Great. Well, no one's typing vigorously at the moment. So um, I'm gonna ask another question just because I'm curious you know, about the woodcock. So I know that they come like through my backyard and, and are they likely nesting right near me or are they just moving through when I hear them in March or you know, how far might they be going or, or do, how do I know if I have the right habitat? Well, in, in March, what you're looking for is they're using those fields and settings to display and uh, try to attract females in the area. And they're going to set up in areas that have that young forest nearby where they're going to go feed and they know is, is better nesting habitat for the females. So if you have them displaying in the area, you should have them nesting. It might not be on your property or on your field, but there has to be suitable habitat nearby where the female is going to uh, go off and nest after, after the breeding season. Great. Um, so Tiffany wants to tell you that it was a great talk and well done presentation. So thank you, Tiffany. And um, there's a question too from Sylvia and she'd like to know, are there current habitat improvement projects that are going around on in Vermont for the woodcock? There are a number of programs available. One, um, a number of our biologists work with what we call the EQIP program that helps lay out uh, habitat improvement projects and actually provides some funding for a, a forest management plan. And also some of the, if it's pre-commercial where you can't sell the timber, there, there is that option. The Forest Service has been trying to do some early successional forest on their various parcels up and down the Green Mountains. Um, very ex various extent of what they can do. It takes a little longer to go through that process because there are so many user groups and so many people that want to comment on it and uh, legal steps that they have to do, but they are trying to move ahead with some young forest initiative there. And we have done some on our own state wildlife management areas. We have about 140,000 acres statewide through all the different regions. 
where we're incorporating young forest into our, um, our long range management plans and trying to use uh, a lot of our surveys out there to find the right places, uh, conservation design program that's, that's out there uh, to, to use as a beginning guide. But so there are some programs ongoing and we've actually um, been working, I don't know if uh, folks may know Mark Labar from Audubon, Vermont. They've been working with us to help uh, work on private lands to reclaim them from exotics and get natural shrubs and, and grasslands back into them in the Champlain Valley. And they've been using the, the state's habitat stamp money to accomplish that work. Great. Um, Mary Beth was wondering uh, if you know the average number of woodcock harvested each year and is that harvest trending up or down? We on average have about 1,200 to 1,400 active woodcock hunters in the state and estimates are somewhere between 3,000 to 500 birds, sorry, 3,000 and 5,000 birds harvested annually. And those trends with the uh, the, the type of habitat and the amount of birds has gone down. You, you know, obviously if the population has decreased some, the, the uh, ability for hunters to find those birds usually decrease and hunter effort and harvest usually falls that trend. So it's, it's decreased over the decades. All righty. I'll give another minute or two. Anybody else want to type a question in the chat box? We can throw that at Dave. If not, um, We'll, we'll close this out a little early and everybody can get on to their, their evening adventures. All right, well, I wanna thank you all for, for being on here tonight. Uh, again, my name is Lisa Sawsville and I'm with Vermont Coverts. Uh, we are currently running our annual drive. Uh, if you've enjoyed this program, I hope you'll zip on over to our website and make a donation so you can support these efforts to continue bringing you programs both live and in person and also Zooming online uh, as we continue to move through uh, this pandemic. It was great to see all of you tonight and thank you again, David. <laughs>